So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Don Rakowski. And so while he is coming up, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Rakowski. If you look in your packet, you will be able to, to see uh, this, this paper. Uh, has Dr. Rakowski and also Brendan, Brendan Rocky, our later speaker. But Dr. Rakowski, the reason that we, we felt like he would be a good one to bring here and speak to us is because he is uh, world-renowned on, on carbon in the soil and why carbon is valuable here in the, so in the soil. Um, and so he comes to us from uh, Minnesota, he spent his career at the, uh, with the North Central Soil Conservation Research Laboratory and uh, has done a lot with uh, no-till as well as cover crops and finding ways to increase carbon in the soil and why carbon is valuable. I won't read all of that. You'll be able to read it yourself. Um, but we really are excited to have him come and speak to us. And so, Dr. Rakowski. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm truly honored to be here and hope that uh, we can provide a little information that might help you make some management decisions. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here and like to thank Bracken and Tony and Danielle and Meredith for helping arrange the, uh, the visit here. So, um, as, a, as a retired soil scientist, uh, I sort of in strange country where you have to irrigate everything that's going. And so I'm going to provide you with some of my biases about what goes on in the corn and soybean belt. But the principles, I think, are going to be the same. So uh, if you'll just bear with me and try to think about the principles, then we can uh, have some common points for discussion. So we're trying to feed a uh, expanding global population. We're doing some damage to the environment. We're concerned about our children's future. I think we have one chance, and that is what I call conservation agriculture. All of these things rest on our living soil and soil health that depends on soil organic carbon. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, good. So I can wave my hands and do whatever. So anyway, the point is that carbon is the key to a lot of what we're doing in sustainable agriculture. So we already heard the definition of um, soil health from Tony, and I would like to compliment Tony. Uh, he stole about uh, one third of my presentation. But I'm going to give you my version and hope that, uh, that that reinforcement will help you better understand soil health. Soil health is, is a, a real phenomenon now in, in all across the U.S. because it's a response to broader information needs for addressing these multiple complex problems. It include climate change, greenhouse gases, the carbon cycle, soil erosion and land degradation, crop disease and pests depletion and pollution of our water resources and, and loss of biodiversity. This is a, a real phenomenon. And from my perspective, in the last eight or 10 years, there's more conservation on the landscape because of the soil health movement than there's been in the previous 100 years of conservation uh, in our, our agricultural systems. So I want you to understand that, that that soil, to me, is a living miracle. It's alive, and we need to understand what makes the soil tick. I have this quote here from Brian Jurgensen from South Dakota. And if you were a student in my class, you would memorize that and understand that quote in and out. Carbon is the framework and the fuel of every living thing. And so for emphasis, I'm going to repeat it in case you missed it the first time. Carbon is the framework and the fuel of every living thing. Now, your body's about 18.2% carbon. 
So it's pretty important to you. And so I hope that you will get the idea that we have to start thinking a little bit more about carbon because of its relative importance to us in agriculture. There's a lot of things that happen with a healthy soil biology. We have this carbon cycling we're going to talk about more. The nutrient cycling is one of the spin-off benefits. But we get this enhanced water infiltration, more water storage, just like uh, Tony told us. The formation of these stable aggregates are important to us. We get this nitrogen fixation, free nitrogen from the air. We get this enhanced plant growth and all of these benefits that are important to us as we try to uh, maintain food security for our expanding population. So <clears throat> when we take a talk about soil health, we traditionally talk about biological, physical, and chemical properties and processes that are important to us in agriculture. And up till about eight or 10 years ago, we put a lot of emphasis on the physical and the chemical properties. And I have listed some of them there. But now, as we learn a little bit more about the system, learn a little bit more about what Mother Nature is doing for us, we're starting to put more emphasis on the biological process and properties. So if we want a healthy food, we need to have a healthy soil. And from my perspective, the soil carbon fuels this soil health phenomenon. And so I'm trying to convince you that we want to view soil health through a carbon lens. I want you to think about carbon and what you can do to manage it differently in your production systems. Now, one of the problems that we had in intensive agriculture is some of the degradation that you see in this slide, basically all forms of, of soil erosion. Now, the, the one term that Tony used that a soil scientist doesn't like to use in this thing is the, the word dirt. To a soil scientist, it's soil. Well, I have coffee with a group of elderly folks. We have a group called the International Order of Rusty Zippers. And so, and part of the conversation, I'm talking to them about what I think is important in agriculture. And in Minnesota, we call that black stuff on, on the snowdrift, snurt. And because of the importance to me as a soil scientist, this 86-year-old guy says, why don't you call it snoil? Snow plus soil. And I give that guy credit for coining a new scientific term for that. I saw an example of it in some of your slides here. But the problem is with intensive agriculture, intensive tillage agriculture, we're losing soil faster than Mother Nature can make it. And I use this quote from David Montgomery up in the northwest part of the country, that soil is not lost because we farm, Soil is lost because how we farm. So the message there is the way we're farming now is resulting in some erosion. And unfortunately, we're losing it faster than Mother Nature can make it. So is there another way that we can farm to do it better? And this is where I think the soil health comes into the system. So the water erosion is very visible. We all can see that and understand that something happening. The wind erosion is also very visible. But we have this thing called aerobic erosion. That's a term that a farmer gave me. When you open up the soil, it goes from an oxygen concentration in the soil of about 14 or 15 percent to 21 percent. And it's kind of like pouring gasoline on the fire. That carbon is oxidized and goes out to the atmosphere. Well, there's another type of erosion called tillage erosion. And this is slowly visible and it may take a generation to see some of the erosion that takes place. And one of the pieces of research we did in the lower right-hand corner, there was 18 inches of soil removed from that point over a period of 30 years with the moldboard plow. There was enough topsoil removed that they had to change the name of the soil type. Now, the soil didn't leave the field. It was just redistributed on that rolling landscape to give us subsoil that has a very high pH and other negative properties. So tillage erosion is something that we have to consider because it results in a degradation that's important to us. 
So if we're concerned about sustainable agriculture, we have to be concerned about soil degradation. And some of this is being exacerbated with the climate degradation and some of these extreme events that we are experiencing. And if we don't start getting this under control, we're going to end up with this global disaster of flushing all of our topsoil down the river and out to the Gulf. So there are some negatives with what's happening with the way we're doing it. Well, getting back to the carbon story, one of the first things we have to do is understand how we capture that carbon. And the sun powers all life through the carbon cycle. And the plants are the main source of our food and our energy generation. So this soil is the Earth's living skin, now that we understand that the soil biology is there. And that produces about 95% of our food. So from that perspective, the soil is very important to us. But we understand that now that capturing that carbon is utilizing the solar energy and converting it to a biochemical form in the form of the sugars that, that Tony talked about is very important to us. So you as agricultural producers, your challenge is to uh, manage the plants, to capture solar energy, and transform it into biochemical energy, that food or the sugar that, that Tony was talking about, because that feeds all life on Earth. And so the solar energy has been free to us so far, and it's responsible for the start of this carbon cycle that's important to us. The carbon cycle here is shown taking carbon dioxide plus water to form that sugar that Tony was talking about. And this is how we capture the energy and convert it from solar energy to biochemical energy. If you take the reverse of that process, taking the sugar plus a little oxygen, we call it respiration. And that energy is what's released to us so we can do useful work. I depict it as a relatively simple carbon cycle, but I can assure you it's very, very complex, and the devil is in the details. But this is one of the main systems we have to start understanding if we're going to manage that carbon better during our, our uh, agricultural production. So we not only talk about carbon cycles, but we talk about carbon flow because it's an energy flowing process. And so I repeat some of this energy flow through the, from the sun through the process of photosynthesis to form the sugar. That sugar is transported down to the ear, to the head of the wheat. Uh, it's, some of it goes to the roots, oozes out of the roots as exudates to feed the microbes and some of the other soil fauna, and contributes to the nutrient cycling and the carbon cycling. So we have plant nutrition, and the food nutrition is what we take in for our, our benefit and our use. That includes the food, the feed, the fiber, and the fuel. And so we take and utilize these materials and respire away carbon dioxide that comes back into the cycle again to start that carbon cycle all over. So this carbon flow and carbon cycle, you have to consider the, the elemental component, but you also have to consider the energy, because that is the primary food of the soil biology. That's the primary food of all, all that we eat uh, in terms of the, the energy required for our existence. So one of our challenges, at least over in Minnesota, is trying to identify how to expand the growing season. And so I utilize this example of a conventional tillage uh, corn system where we have the plant growing and covering and protecting the soil for about six months out of the year. This is a conventional tillage uh, monocropping system. And if you look at that graph, we have about four months in the early part of the year and two months in the latter part of the year where we don't have any protection on the soil leaving it bare. And this is when we get a lot of wind, water, and erosion, and soil degradation. So our challenge is working with cover crops to try to figure out how we can get cover 
365 days a year. Well, I took and made some calculations for our location there in Morris, and during that six-month period, we utilized about 61% of the energy that's available to us over the whole annual, uh, annual cycle. And that six months where there's nothing happening, we are wasting 39% of the energy during that winter period. Wasting 39% of the energy that Mother Nature provides for us is a big waste. And we have some responsibility to try to figure out how to utilize that energy, not only to protect the soil, but to help feed the expanding population. We cannot afford to start wasting 40% of the energy that Mother Nature's made available to us. So how can we do this? Well, one of the things we can do is utilize cover crops as part of that system. And so during the center part of the period, we'll have live plant cover from, from the corn plants or soybean plants or whatever. But we've got also work to try to extend the season earlier, giving us two months cover with some cool, spe uh, cool season species that can protect the soil and capture some carbon. We can also get some live cover crops on the tail end that are also cool season species that can give us some protection and cover. And so, uh, but we have 20 and 30 below temperatures in Minnesota so that it's very difficult for anything to exist. And part of our strategy there is, now let's find something that can grow and be dormant on the surface, still protecting the soil, and then when the first opportunity to rise for temperature and water condition, we will get this growth and protection of the soil. So there are some opportunities, but there are a lot of challenges. This is not as easy as I'm making it sound. But we have to try to do that, because we need to have that soil protection 100% of the time. And if it's protected 25% of the time with dormant crop biomass, then it's, it's one way we can maintain uh, soil quality and maintain soil health. And uh, Tony used the, uh, the term crop residue. That's a negative term. Trash is a negative term. I'd like to be it positive because of the value it is in terms of carbon content. It's about 45% carbon, and it's very important to us in terms of uh, protecting the soil. So let's give it a positive term and utilize crop biomass because the way it can be used to protect the soil. So I'd like to reinforce that view because plant carbon is about 45% of the material. And this gives that plant a lot of power that we need to learn and, and, and manipulate. That plant can capture carbon, can store some carbon. And that's a form of energy for us that's very important. The grain is our food source and our energy source. And with the plant growing with active roots into the soil, we can get soil carbon input to the soil. The protection of the surface, we get many uh, environmental benefits, and it does a lot to enhance our quality of life. So I hope that you can get the importance of maintaining the crop material on the surface, give it a positive name of crop biomass rather than some negative things of trash and residue and things that are just left over. From my perspective, Carbon is the C, the capital C, that starts conservation. If you look at the contour strips there, the corn plants are about 45% carbon, all contributing to decreasing erosion. If you look at the grass waterway, the grass is about 45% carbon, contributing to decreasing the erosion. And if you look at our no-till corn and soybeans, the crop biomass that's on the surface protecting the soil, again, is about 45% carbon. And so from my perspective, as a soil scientist, it makes it a little difficult to say, but from my perspective, conservation is more about plant management than soil management because of the importance of carbon. And you guys in conservation think about that a little bit. One place where I have a little trouble with the word conservation is when it modifies the word tillage. 
Conservation tillage is a broad term used to define any tillage system with the primary objective of reducing soil and water loss. This is an excellent objective, an excellent goal. But conservation tillage has very loose limits on the definition of soil disturbed and crop biomass management. The term, in quotes, conservation tillage fuels a misguided sense of entitlement and a misguided sense of conservation. And I go so far as to say that conservation tillage is an oxymoron. So most conservation tillage is more tillage than conservation. And I think it's oversold for some of the benefits. While the concept is good, the actual practice is bad for the amount of soil that's disturbed in that tillage operation. And so if we look at conservation tillage, which normally has a definition of about 30% plant cover, uh, we have basically 70% of the soil that's bare. And so you get this raindrop impact that Tony showed you that's happening to dis, uh, dislodge that soil and basically degrade the soil surface and end up for soil crusting. So as a scientist, I have to give you a couple examples of measurements that show that. And I use the data from a group from the University of Kentucky where they compared a conventional tillage system, a conservation tillage system with a chisel plow with a straight shank, with a no-till or a direct seeding system. I only want you to focus on the sediment loss over on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the chart. And if we take and set the value for no-till as one and calculate the ratio of the sediment loss uh, to, the ratio, to the value of no-till, for the conservation tillage system, we get a value of 11. There's 11 times more soil loss from the conservation tillage system than there is from the no-till system. If we take a look at the conventional, that relative loss is 52 times, as you might expect for a uh, conventional tillage system. But even with the conservation system, 11 times the soil loss of the no-till system is not tolerable because we're losing soil faster than Mother Nature is making it. If you understand that it takes 500 to 1,000 years to make one inch of new soil, you'll understand that we can't afford to lose soil, any soil, due to erosion. And one of the terms that aggravates me as a soil scientist is the, the T value, the tolerable erosion loss that should be set to zero rather than two or three or four tons per acre. So part of our challenge with this terminology of conservation tillage is that it's not very quantitative. And so I have the schematic about the volume of soil disturbed by different types of tillage operation. So the moldboard plow and the disc plow are on the extreme left, and then the low disturbance no-till and the high disturbance no-till are on the extreme right. And 90% of those tillage implements in the middle are called conservation tillage. So you can go from a very large volume of soil disturbed to a very small volume of soil disturbed, and it's still called conservation tillage. I, and some people include no-till as part of conservation tillage, and I'm of the school, I'm trying to get people to think about minimum soil disturbance as the extreme form. But what happens when you do this volume of soil disturbed um, with the different tools the residue is incorporated, and the residue is, maximizes the residue soil contact, so it enhances the decomposition, and you have less time for the protection from it. So conservation tillage is a step in the right direction, and I quote uh, Dave Franson from North Dakota that it's just not good enough. And I hope you'll think about that. So when we talk about conservation agriculture, we're shifting gears now, and we're going to try to mimic the ecosystem services that Mother Nature provides. Uh, the plows for Mother Nature are the tap roots of some of those cover crops, and the earthworm that Tony showed us. And with that system, we get all these soil health benefits. 
we get more carbon, we get more biology, we use less diesel and less fertilizer, and on. The greater than sign means more, and the less than symbol means less. But if we look at man's plow, all we do is get soil degradation with it. We end up with less carbon, less soil biology, more diesel, more fertilizer, and on with that list of benefits. And intensive tillage has been responsible for us, at least us in the Midwest, where we have lost between 30 and 60 percent of the carbon that was there when we put the land into production. And a large portion of that is due to the intensive tillage. There's a portion that's also due to the change from perennial species to annual species that results in lower carbon input. There's three other reasons that I'd be happy to talk with you uh, when we have a little bit more time. So tillage is important to me because it disrupts these natural cycles. And we in agriculture have to manage the water, the carbon, and the nitrogen cycle. And when we disturb one cycle, they're so intertwined and interdependent that it disrupts the other two cycles. And so I'm putting emphasis on the carbon cycle because that's what I'm asked to talk about. But that disrupting the carbon cycle with tillage disrupts the water cycle and disrupts the nitrogen cycle. And so we in agriculture have to understand how intensive tillage is modifying these processes and properties that are important to us in terms of maintaining food security. So I did a little bit of research back in my younger days, and um, we were trying to characterize the effect of tillage on carbon dioxide loss. And so in the lower left part of it, I add these flickering flames as a symbol of the oxidation that takes place uh, the slow burning of the, of the carbon, converting it to CO2 that goes out to the atmosphere. Well, the challenge is that you cannot see carbon dioxide. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless, and you can't perceive that it's there. But I hope I can convince you that, with a little bit of data, that that cloud of dust behind the tillage implement is analogous to the cloud of carbon dioxide that goes out as a result of tillage. But with that dust, you can see that dust, you can feel that dust, you can taste that dust, and so you perceive that there's a problem. Well, I hope that you'll get the same impression about what happens to the soil when we till it and the carbon dioxide release. We developed this portable chamber system called Mr. Gem, and it's nothing more than a box that's placed over the soil with mixing, and we take a sample of the gas back through an ANS, a computer-controlled data system and an analyzer. It measures the concentration once a second for 60 seconds. And at the end of that time, the computer beeps, the operator lifts the chamber, and moves to the next plot. Well, I told you that carbon dioxide was invisible, but I used these plumes from our ethanol plant to try to give you some idea of the gas exchange that takes place when you open up the soil with a tillage implement. We're trying to characterize and quantify these invisible effects of these invisible forces. We're not sure about all of what's happening, but we're pretty certain of the results that happen in terms of releasing a lot of carbon dioxide. So we had a snow-till system where we drove the tractor through to get the same amount of compaction in the research plots. Then we had what we call the residue management, which was a very small strip till about three inches deep and maybe about six inches wide, disturbing the soil with a, with a fluted culture. Then we had a fertilizer knife that gave us a V-shaped form of soil disturbance and compared that with the, uh, the mole knife, which gives us this U-shaped, more U-shaped volume of soil disturbance, slightly difference in volume. And then we had a low disturbance subsoil shank that went down to about 17 inches. And then we compared it with the mole board plow where we have had the maximum amount of CO2 loss from the system. So we made those measurements, we pulled the equipment through, come in with the chamber, repeated the measurements several times, and we look at the summary of the data on this chart. On the y-axis, we have the cumulative loss of carbon dioxide, and on the x-axis, we have the different tillage tools that we evaluated. And you can see that 
at five hours after tillage, we lost the most carbon dioxide with the mow-worn plow. The next was the subsoil, and it decreased to the least amount with the no-till system. And even after 24 hours after tillage, we get the same relative relationship with the mow-worn plow, <coughs> the most loss, and the no-till with the least amount of CO2 loss. So if we take those results and we plot them as a function of the cross-sectional area of soil disturbed, and if we assume a unit length of row, we have a volume term. And so the carbon dioxide loss is proportional to the volume of soil disturbed. And before that arrow came in there, you know that no-till was on the low end of the thing with our small strip till, and the subsoil shank and the moldboard plow was up at the top. And for a scientist to get a R-squared value of about 0.97, it suggests there's a pretty strong relationship there. So the point is that there's a, uh, that the CO2 loss is directly proportional to the volume of soil disturbed in the tillage operation. Any of you that have driven a tractor pulling a plow 10 inches deep know that it takes a little more diesel doing that than it does with some of these other forms of strip tillage. And so my colleague Dave Archer from Bismarck put together this data showing that there's a pretty strong linear relationship between the diesel fuel consumed and tillage intensity. So from my perspective, intensive tillage becomes a double negative. Not only do we burp a lot of carbon dioxide out of the soil with the moldboard plow, we also have a lot of CO2 going out from the diesel fuel consumed to accomplish that tillage operation. And from, our, from my perspective, that doesn't help our carbon footprint in agriculture. We did another study using the same piece of equipment, the moldboard plow. And so we plowed as shallow as we can go and still have inversion tillage, and that was about a four inch depth. We had other treatments with so six and eight inch, and 11 inches as deep as we could go and pull it with the equipment we had. We made the same kind of measurements with the chamber, and when we look at the results, again, we get the least amount with the no-till treatment, and as we go progressively deeper with the plow, progressively increasing the volume of soil disturbed, we see this nearly linear increase in carbon dioxide release. Well, this is sort of comforting to me as a scientist because we get the same results whether we use one tool or a diversity of tools suggesting that the relationship of CO2 emissions is almost directly proportional to the volume of soil disturbed. And using the analogy again with diesel fuel, there's the direct relationship there. So uh, if I had any claim to fame, it's these couple of data sets that I hope make you think a little bit about what's happening in terms of the carbon within the plant system. So I would switch gears a little bit now and try to give you some impression about what tillage does to the soil biology. This is a sort of a standard one, trying to give some idea of the uh, soil biology. You can see there's a diversity of critters. The ones that I think are most important to us are the bacteria and the fungi and a few of the actinomycetes. But the earthworm there is one of my favorite because that's the best fish bait for walleye in Minnesota. So I have a certain fondness for that one. But the point is, there is this diversity of little critters in the soil. And I don't know all the details about all of them, but I do know that they're important for us in terms of nutrient cycling. So when we consider this biological system, we go from the big mammals, the gophers in our area, the worms, down through the bacteria and the algae. And when you look at the sum total of that soil fauna and the microbial action, it's the equivalent of grazing two Afri African elephants on, on an acre of land. And I utilize this example from Jerry Hatfield, the director of the National Tilth Lab. This is how much nutrition, how much carbon is required to maintain that population of biology that's important to us. And if you understand that those elephants eat about 300 pounds of hay a day, 
you get an impression of how much carbon, how much biomass needs to be there to maintain these little critters at optimum activity. So from my perspective, intensive tillage sort of butchers the biology. It cuts and slices and dices the soil and blends and mix and inverts the soil, creating havoc with the soil biology. And I tried to give you some idea of the soil loss with the, the work that we did. And so we get the minimum amount if we don't disturb the soil, get the maximum with the primary tillage, and there's a little bit more loss with secondary tillage. So from my perspective, tillage is a biotic disturbance. And I like to talk about the turmoil of tillage. The, if we look at the soil as a natural living system, that it contains a lot of life, and when it's tilled intensively, it's dramatically changed. And I think it can be considered analogous to a human reaction to a combination of an earthquake, an asteroid impact, a forest fire, a tsunami, a hurricane, and a tornado, all rolled into one perturbation event. And that factory that Tony talked about, if that was your house, you wouldn't be very happy, you wouldn't be very effective, and you wouldn't be very efficient in doing the nutrient cycling that's expected of you. So there's this physical disruption that I think is important that we have to understand as we get more into the soil health terminology the, uh, those little critters are pretty important to us, and we want to maintain in, them in a healthy status. So in Minnesota and Denmark, this intensive tillage opens all-you-can-eat buffet for the birds and the microbes. And I don't know how many uh, seagulls you might have here, and whether that's a phenomenon in Utah or not, but uh, it's indicative of what we're doing to the soil biology. Because they're not out there for their health, they're out there to get a slice and dice worm or grub or some other insect that they need for their energy. Sometimes tillage creates a priming effect for some microbes, and that might be good under some conditions, but it results in this complete destruction of the fungal hyphae network and the structure of that microphysal fungi and, the, and some of the arthropods. And Tony had an example of the picture of that network. And, but we've got to understand that it's a very delicate network. Any disturbance at all disrupts that fungal network. So we understand that if we want to increase carbon and nitrogen in the soil, we have to have a large fungi to bacteria ratio. And tillage actually sends that fungi to bacteria ratio the other direction, the wrong direction. And so if we want to store more carbon and nitrogen within the soil for subsequent crops, we must try to maximize that fungi to bacteria ratio, which means virtually no soil disturbance because of the way of any tillage destroys that delicate fungal network. Associated with that is this super duper glue called glomalin. Glomalin, glomalin, the same thing. And what I have is an example of some data from Sarah Wright and Chris Nichols obtained uh, showing the amount of glomalin in the soil. And I understand that Meredith has a demonstration she might show on, on how this affects the soil structure. But if we take a look at the value on the plowed system, the value is 0 0.7 with, with zero years of, of no-till. But if you go one year of no-till, the value goes to 1.3. Three years of no-till goes up to 1.7, and with 15 years, the value goes up to 2.7. And that is important to us because of what those uh, fungi are doing for us. And the glomalin is also a good form to sequester the carbon. The carbon in glomalin is not readily available for decomposition, so we can sort of store it a little bit, and it becomes slowly available. So if you like fungi in your soil, I want you to start thinking about how you can manage them so that they can be effective in carrying out all these functions that are important to us. So <clears throat> we're talking about carbon loss, and then we have to start talking about carbon input. And 
the environmental benefits come from cover crop cocktails. And I give this farmer from North Dakota credit for that cover crop cocktail phrase because it's a very good description of what's happening when we have diverse mixes of cover crops. And I put the capital C, representing carbon, in quotes because there's a lot of carbon that comes into that system. There's also economic benefits with cash cover crops that all of these point to carbon. And so we come back to those same three group of properties and processes that affect us in agriculture, the biological, the physical, and the chemical. And I hope you understand that these cover crop mixes, going from narrow carbon to nitrogen ratios to wide carbon nitrogen ratios, and the idea of diversity in maintaining the, uh, the soil health parameters that are important to us becomes very important. And the cover crops give us an opportunity to maintain that diversity by capturing nitrogen from the air with the legumes, getting taproot crops like tillage radishes to penetrate the soil and result in all these additional benefits in terms of water use efficiency and soil properties. So we have this list of benefits that are important to us in terms of recycling the nutrients that are directly related to cover crop carbon. And I put together this list where I've identified the benefits in blue that are directly related to carbon benefits when you use these multi-species cover crops. And you can see that the majority of the benefits are directly related to the carbon and, and the benefits that are there. But when you understand why we're doing this, you have to understand that we have to maintain this system that has minimum soil disturbance and uh, cover crops for carbon input. And in our conservation agriculture systems and our soil health systems, the bottom line is the synergistic simplicity of minimum soil disturbance, which minimizes the carbon loss and the soil loss from erosion, and the use of these diverse rotations and cover crop mixes, which maximizes the soil cover and the carbon input. It's all required to maintain our soil diversity protection and the regeneration benefits in conservation agriculture. And if you were a student in my class, you would have that statement memorized and hopefully understood. Switching gears, uh, Tony talked a little bit about plant nutrients, and I don't need to repeat them, but many of these nutrients come from the biomass that we're trying to manage. Uh, as he indicated, we get a certain number of them from the air, and the rest of them come from the soil or the fertilizer bag. So I use this quote by William Albrecht. It said that organic matter functions mainly as it is decayed and destroyed. Its value lies in its dynamic nature. And so when we're working with organic matter, it's very, very dynamic. And so if we start on the left with crop biomass on the surface, it's about 45% carbon. And when it's there long enough, it can be incorporated and digested and decomposed, giving off CO2 and releasing some nutrients so that we end up with soil organic matter that's about 58% carbon. And so the difference between 58% carbon in the soil organic matter and 45% carbon in the crop biomass is about 13%, which represents all those 17 or 18 nutrients that we must supply to the plants to maintain efficient nutrient cycling. And so when you're working with biomass, you have to consider that contribution because it's substantial and it's renewable because of the cycling that's taking place. So <clears throat> when we have these nutrient cycling synergies, we have to understand something about the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And I picked this up from uh, one of our NRCS friends where conservation starts with a C and ends with an N, indicating the importance of the carbon to nitrogen ratio in nutrient cycling. And so these are two of the main nutrients, but it's their ratio that's important in controlling the cycling of the other nutrients. If you understand carbon-nitrogen ratio 
of a wheat crop, maybe 80 to 100 carbon to one nitrogen, and how that's different from that of an alfalfa crop that you might grow that might be of the order 20 carbon to one nitrogen, that alfalfa will decompose a lot faster than the wheat straw. And there's opportunities in terms of the diversity of the cover crops to get groups of cover crops into the system that have a diverse carbon-nitrogen ratio that allows you to extend the benefits over the full season when there's biological activity taking place. So <clears throat> when we talk about agriculture, and in your part of the country, apparently water is pretty limiting. And so when we understand that agriculture utilizes about 70% of the water resources, uh, we have to start thinking about how to do it better. And so with the global water crisis, we in agriculture must use, to, uh, must use water more efficiently. And with conservation agriculture, te conservation agriculture techniques, we can use carbon to manage and increase our water use efficiency. So from my perspective, plant carbon is one of our greatest water management tools. If you get that mulch layer developed, it does everything to increase the, evap the infiltration. It does everything to increase the transpiration, contributes to soil organic matter, and available water holding capacity. At the same time, it decreases evaporation, erosion, runoff, and soil crusting. It also can result in increasing rooting depth because that root is about 45% carbon as it's working through the soil going deeper into the profile. So we get more storage, more root exudates, more biophores, and we get some decrease in deep drainage and leaching. So from my perspective, good carbon management is required for maximum water use efficiency. One of the natural synergies that uh, a colleague of mine found out from Wisconsin is that the roots of the taproot crop, in this case a sugar beet plant, can go deeper into the profile. And later into the season, the earthworms will come along and find this tunnel of food, work right down that, say, uh, that biophore, consuming that carbon that's there, and resulting in some exchange in terms of nutrients smearing the wall of that biophore. So now we have a nice channel that's going deeper than it would without the worms, and the, the taproot alone that's available for the next crop that will send it through the path of least resistance. And that path of least resistance is lined with nutrients as a result of the slime that the earthworm left there. So this synergistic relationship between the roots and the worms enables us to generate more storage and uh, volume of soil available for nutrient uptake. So the, the biopores that are created allows the earthworms to go a little deeper and allows the rooting of the su subsequent crops to go a little deeper. And so I use this example going from a root zone of about three foot deep to a, a root zone of about six foot deep. And in that, we can get three inches of additional water stored by letting the water in through the biopores and then maintaining it there for subsequent crops. Uh, they might may not be a lot of water from your perspective, but every little bit helps. So there's some things that help contribute in, the, there are in terms of small amounts that we can utilize to manage this carbon, manage this crop biomass to give us a better water use efficiency. The, the mulch effect is one. The differences in infiltration is another. When you add 1% carbon, it increases the storage capacity. And when you have the cover crops there, they enable the, the more access by the worms and deeper penetration of the water. Anyway, this one example is about 11 inches of water that's made available by managing carbon in terms of the different forms of biomass that are there. And so the sum total of these small amounts of water loss saved due to carbon management, plus the other synergies of carbon, will go a long way towards our food security and ecosystem services. And I understand one of the challenges here in a zone of limited water, uh, there's some uh, hesitation about trying to figure out how to use cover crops because of water concern. 
consume. And I think there's some things that we need to try from a research perspective to see if we can't overcome that hesitation for using cover crops in a, in a drier climate. So one way that I can summarize this is to compare what I call conventional and tillage agriculture, or industrial ag, or whatever you want to call it, and the conservation agriculture system. And I will talk about conservation agriculture system because it's represented by the, the light blue errors. And so with conservation agriculture, we get less evaporation. We get more transpiration, more water going through the plant being the benefit to us. We get more infiltration. We get less runoff because we have more infiltration. More biopores results in more water storage and more plant available water. So trying to summarize what we can do in agriculture by managing the cover crops, by minimizing the soil disturbance, results in enhanced water use efficiency. So this conservation agriculture system I've been talking about is based on three principles, very similar to the soil health principles that Tony talked about, and we'll make that comparison. So we talk about continuous crop biomass cover, diverse rotations in cover crops, minimum soil disturbance. And this fourth category allows for local adaption of technology and nutrient and pest management. It op offers an opportunity for the farmer to pursue some of his individual objectives and site-specific objectives for his type of land. And it also allows for the incorporation of cattle, as, as Tony was making the point this morning. And so when we're working with Mother Nature and improving soil health, we have to understand the principles. And so I use this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who says that as to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can success successfully select his own method. And so I hope you understand the difference between principles and methods. Conservation agriculture is nature's way because we maintain continuous minimum soil disturbance, maximum carbon input, and maintenance of biodiversity. If we take and compare what I call the conservation agriculture system and the principles of soil health that Tony talked about, we have three of them that are exactly the same. And I want you to understand that both systems are based on soil organic carbon. The only slight difference is the uh, soil health people want to include living roots as long as possible. But if I have a continuously growing plant as long as biologically possible, I've got roots there automatically. I'm a soils guy, and I don't really understand too much about cattle, but I do recognize the importance. And Tony was spot on in talking about the benefits that cattle can provide in terms of maintaining diversity, recycling some of that carbon. So whether you're talking conservation agriculture or soil health, I think we're singing the same song. It's just that the soil health terminology has got most of you here that would not have come to listen to something about conservation agriculture. But the principles are the same, and I hope you understand them and, and will work towards implementing them on your landscape. Conservation agriculture is about managing carbon for food security. And one of the things that Tony mentioned was the decreased input costs. Now, this is anecdotal data that I've got from farmers in terms of writing articles and picking out of the literature. But the decreased input cost for fuel and labor can be greater than 50%. Decreased input costs for equipment and repair and maintenance can be greater than 40 to 50 percent. The decreased input costs for nitrous and fertilizer can be greater than 50 percent. And if any of you heard Gabe Brown, he will be one of the first ones to tell you that. Pesticides can be decreased. Water management costs can be decreased. Admit of these, these are anecdotal data, but I don't believe those farmers are lying to us because they are doing it for economic reasons and profitable reasons. But this does not cover the other negative externalities that we have to address. The environmental and social costs are not considered in that. The rehabilitation of, of degraded lands and ecosystem services is not considered in that. 
and the efforts to mitigate some of the climate extremes are not considered in that economic package. But if we had to account for them and could find a value for them, they would be very, very important in terms of maintaining a sustainable agriculture system. So conservation agriculture, I think, is very important from an environmental perspective and from an economic perspective because it does decrease the input cost and decreases the degradation that we Benefit by itself may be not such a big deal with respect to the environment, but what you in, when you integrate 14 or 18 of these benefits into a complete package, it becomes a very big deal with respect to the environment and environmental protection and sustainable production. Uh, taking one example of all those things that are there, uh, it may not be such a big deal, but when you put them all together in a package, we're going to end up with a sustainable and regenerative agriculture production system. We have to understand it's a big system, it's a complex system, and anything we can do to enhance these synergistic benefits will help us all down the road. So, as we come into the end of the presentation, I hope you understand that our soils contain these living biological partners. They are partners because they're very important to us in nutrient cycling and helping provide the food. When 95% of our food comes from the soil, those little critters are very important to us. So, soil degradation is caused by one word, from my perspective, intensive tillage. Soil recovery is accomplished by one word, carbon. Soil health maintenance is accomplished by one word, carbon. And if you take nothing more home from your, this presentation, I hope you take the implications of this one slide. And so I end with my little Carby Carbon cartoon character who asks you to keep your carbon footprint small and manage carbon for ecosystem services. This is best done with conservation agricultural practices, employing the principles of soil health that we all must understand if we're going to have food security for future generations. And I'm not sure where we are with time, but I'll end there. And if there's time for questions, if not, we'll look forward to questions in the, uh, the roundtable sessions. Thank you.